obviously, I think that's the extension or the screen uh, mm -hmm. duplicator. But it's it's what we know any more chairs or anything. Thank you, sir. Oh. Well, sure we have it fills up tends to fill up pretty well. I think we're okay, considering it's like 10 o'clock now. So we should be able to should be able to handle the stragglers. Right, thanks. Sorry to pull you away from here. It's your business. Tell you what. Number. You can text me since we're not running back there all the time. Seven zero three. Three nine nine five zero two six. Okay, thanks. Shoot me a quick text. Let me know what it is. Thank you. You're not having to disrupt your kind of keeping. Thank you. Thank you. We are right at the uh, 10 o'clock mark. We have just got the project of working. We should give us some more minutes here to get, get settled. But first of all, welcome to Novolog. I see quite a few new faces. <laughs> um, it's always nice to see more new people coming in. If you don't mind, let us know uh, either on Meetup or on the list what brought you here, particularly how you found us. That really makes it easier for us to figure out where, how do we get the word out about the cool speakers that we're going to get in to talk about things. But before we get into the actual topic, um, you might have noticed this is a very nice location. Uh, and lots of facilities, and uh, this is not donated space uh, in the sense of giving to us for free. We actually have a sponsor who's paying for this switch line, and we are greatly appreciative for that service. As long as I've been a NOLOG, we've always fought to figure out a place we can get in for free. And it's getting hard, as you can see, this group is really getting big. <laughs> and meeting at the library is really not possible anymore because of that size. So I cannot say how appreciative we are for this line for sponsoring us. And Uh, yeah, if you guys don't want to stand up, they eventually come today because they have something to ask of the group. So I thought, why not have give them the chance to talk to them? Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Tengrass. I'm the VP for Systems Engineering and Operations at Ridgeline. Uh, we're proud to sponsor this. We're actually we're happy to do this. We're glad this works out for everybody. Uh, and I appreciate you guys taking the time on Saturday morning to uh, enjoy this and learn uh, and do a little networking. For those who don't know, Ridgeline, we're located right around the corner, a uh, boutique contractor doing really unique communication systems, a tremendous amount of lines work in there. Uh, we're a fast growing company, mostly because of our environment. We're creating unique uh, deployments for different customers, but we do it in an environment that lets the employees chase their technical passions and turn that into something that the customer can use. And we're not creating, you know, cookie cutter. It's every, every solution is unique and different. Uh, great employee benefits there, including a 20% or 20 401k contribution, which is pretty unique in our market. Uh, so on breaks, uh, at the end of this, if you're interested, please come chat. Come find us. Adam, if you put your hand up. There's several, actually, Ridgeline employees put your hand up. There's a couple of us here. 
Um, Adam and I will be in the back. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Ridgeline, uh, we have a strong preference for people with a secret clearance or better, but that's not a, uh, a hard and fast. That's the only opportunity in, but that's the majority. Um, so please, take the time to come say any more. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy. Thank you. And if you've been here before, you know we always have Susie here, who's always a recruiter. So if you are looking for a job, uh, several of us probably can tell you about jobs that we, in our job, we were look, we're looking for. If you are curious about whether your resume goes up to snuff, ask. This is a great place to go and ask professionals who do this every day for, is this a good enough way to do it? How can I get in to get the job that you guys are advertising if, if they don't feel that <coughs> your resume is up to snuff for that? Or maybe they, they think, and the next thing you know, you're at the interview, you're getting a job, right? So after we're done, please talk to Richline, please talk to Susie. And maybe you're lucky if you're searching for a job. Cool. So without any further ado, uh, this time we have to get a guest speaker in. Um, my little Lisa, Eliza. I don't know how to pronounce the last word, but Lisa. Lisa is fine. Okay. Um, is I actually a Red Hat consultant who many moons ago wrote and said she may be interested in coming to talk to the group about machine learning and AI. So. We found a good day, which is today. Uh, this is the uh, first time speaking to a group, so if you don't mind, be extra nice. You are very nice to begin with, but she may be a little tiny nervous, and we need to make sure she doesn't feel nervous, right? Uh, she's asked that we don't necessarily interrupt the questions until we get to either the end or to the section that she's uh, basically ready to talk about the section she just covered. So without further ado, the rest of the time is our uh, is our thing. And if you need to use the microphone, you can. If you can talk loud enough like me, you don't need to. But there's people all the way in the back. Need to get you. All right. Thank you, Peter. Um, do people hear me in the back? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Mahmoud Aliza, and I am an associate consultant at Red Hat. I joined right after college. I graduated from Drexel University um, in Philadelphia. I still make this. Um, and I didn't have background in machine learning, but I was super interested in it. And I thought that when I learn about machine learning on, to, throughout my journey, whatever I get to experience, I'm sure that people, um, Red Hat is an open culture um, job environment, so it's that's why um, I spoke to some people from Red Hat who are already in, also involved in this um, meetup group. And that's how I ended up here. Um, so I'm, sh I'm going to share what I learned. And maybe in the audience, group, there are more people who are more experienced on this field than I am. So if, if I'm making a mistake, please uh, correct me. And if you have any thoughts, also share. With that, I will get started. Um, so. The agenda today is I'm going to talk about what intelligence is, um, or at least in computer science, um, what AI is, different fields of AI, um, what machine learning is, and what, what are the differences, what are the overlaps, um, fields of machine learning, especially focusing on computer vision, um, email filtering and data mining. Also, we have the learning approach and algorithm, and um, Neural network is also really big in machine learning, so I'm going to touch base on that, give a brief overview, and how, it's, how machine learning is related to other fields, and last level will end with how we are implementing it at Red Hat. Um, so first off, what is intelligence? Um, so this is a picture from, uh, well, it talks about the Chinese room argument, which is basically the dividing line. It's it's a separation. So on on the right side, on the right side is the person who with infinite amount of resources, um, uh, dictionaries of, uh, that translates English to Chinese Mandarin language, and he doesn't speak English. I mean uh, Chinese at all. And on the left side, you see this person with um, this document that's written in English and he wants it to be translated to Chinese. And he uh, slips that page under the door, and this uh, man with green coat, he goes through all the infinite amount of resources and figures out 
um, how to actually translate that in Chinese, even without speaking or knowing the language itself. So in this scenario, the person on the left would think that the person on the right knows Chinese, even though he doesn't. So this is called the mimicking the intelligence, uh, even so it's pretending to be intelligent even without being intelligent. So that's what that's the intelligence aspect that um, computer science focuses on. Um, and as far as the current algorithm and models are concerned, or in different fields of study, um, this is the intelligence that we focus on. Um, so what is artificial intelligence? Uh, uh, as a field of study, it, it's basically the study and design of artificial intelligent designs um, and a system that can perceive the environment um, and be, um, be aware of the surrounding and then be able to create uh, or decide based on the situation. It can take actions that can uh, minimize the chance of, um, well, maximize the chance of success and minimize the chance of error. Um, that's pretty big. But I have a few slides later on, which kind of differentiates. And if it's still not clear, then maybe there are people who will be able to clarify it more. Um, and this is John McCarthy, who is the, one of the co-founder of AI. And based on his definition, it's a science, the science and engineering of making uh, intelligent machines. That's artificial intelligence. But uh, there is a saying that. Uh, Things that people can do um, by thinking, I'm not actually directly quoting it, but I'm summarizing it. So um, things that we can do and think, machine, machines are able to do it as of now. But things that we do without thinking, that those are the harder part for AI to adapt to. Um, so different fields of AI, uh, there are a lot of other fields, but these are some of the common ones. Uh, we have vision, which is computer vision robotics, uh, autonomous vehicles, and natural language processing. And where machine learning falls, it's actually kind of touch bases on all the other fields. Um, so you can use ML in when you're doing natural language processing, or even vision, or robotics. Or there are um, sectors of natural language processing that wouldn't use machine learning. So machine learning is kind of, as the Venn diagram shows here, it's an overlapping field. Um, so, um, different fields of AI. If you so in machine learning, we have um, deep learning, supervised and unsupervised. I'll go through those um, in later slides. And we have natural language processing, which does some sort of like uh, parses the text um, or natural language, you may say, and translate it. Um, Answers question, generates text, and there is a search system. So we we have we use that at Red Hat. It's called BRMS Business Rules Management System. That's also a part like it underneath it uses machine learning at a certain extent. Um, so um, and then we have vision, uh, speech. Anyways, um, so what is machine learning? The definition is machine learning is a, it's a system that learns from experience E, given some task T, um, and performance P. So what that means is, let's say you you have a system and then it you, you told it to do certain tasks, and when it was doing that task, it went through certain experience, um, and the experience is did it perform well or not. So if it performs well in that experience, it would recognize that, and it will be like, hey, so I, when I was doing this task, um, I went through this good experience. So in future, if I do this task, I will, I will follow the thing that I've done um, to achieve this performance. Um, so it's, if, if the performance improves through, through your experience, that's how you are learning. So that's how the machine is learning. And the difference between machine learning and um, artificial intelligence, it's, it's kind of like a debatable um, concept. A lot of people say that you can't really define intelligence, hence you can't define artificial intelligence. And if you can't define artificial intelligence, you can't really say that machine learning falls within or outside um, 
API. Um, so that's one debate. And some other people would say that, as the diagram earlier showed, machine learning is a subset of AI. Um, and here, um, aside from all those debates, I'm kind of trying to focus on some of the important aspects of AI and ML. And maybe they're different. Um, this is a comparison or contrast, whichever way you want to take it. But artificial intelligence um, or intelligent agent will be creative. So it has the concept of abstract thinking, and it can analyze based on context. Um, and it's more generalistic. So it's not it's not data driven. It's it's well it's data driven, but um, it's if you give it anything outside of the trained data set, it will still be able to be creative and then come up with a solution. Um, an example I have here is a 19 by 19 board, where let's say you trained a system to play um, AlphaGo that's 19 by 19, and if you, if it's a machine learning system or the algorithm is based off of machine learning system and have a large data set, um, and you train the system, hey, play against if it's 19 by 19 and like AlphaGo board, and then all of a sudden you throw on 20 by 20 AlphaGo board, and if it's a ML system, it wouldn't, it it would panic. It would be like, I don't know how to play this because none of my data supported it. But in AI, it wouldn't. It would, because of the way you, you have the algorithm implemented um, in the AI system, it would be able to adapt. Um, so that's where the takeaway is. So ML is more data-driven. It's very specific. And it's like a fighter jet, which knows how to fly and fight, I guess. So it's, it's like very specific um, compared to uh, like an owl who would know not just fly, but still be able to um, like function and do other things. So, okay, that's, that's one of the bad example, but um, recognizes, so ML recognizes pattern in particular situation. That's like, it does pattern recognition really well. Um, some of the AI fields that are not ML, um, for example, rule-based system where People like a business sector use that a lot, like you already mentioned. I said, um, given the specific rule, um, how how would you calculate the entrance at the end of the day for this uh, patient's visit? So that's not like it's not data driven. You are not really like collecting data set and then saying, hey, I had patients visited um, who had this sort of um, like MRI scan and all the other um, like X-rays. If, if it were an ML system, it would go through the data and calculate the answer. But if it's a rule-based system, you are giving it a bunch of rules and it calculates it. So it's, it would seem like there are a lot. Like an AI system is uh, like a giant if else statement, um, like a code where you have like a lot of if else statements. But a good algorithm, AI algorithm, wouldn't necessarily have if else statement. It would implement and utilize models. Natural language processing, uh, not, there are non ML based NLP as well. Uh, I have an example later. Um, classic computer vision, where maybe it's not totally like data driven. Um, there are algorithms behind the scene that, that, would, de like, that would help the computer like, system detect a thief um, who is like entering the building or um, instead of just like recognizing pixels, it would recognize a human. And it, it wouldn't necessarily use ML. And I don't really know much about symbolic logic, but as long as you are using symbol to come up with logic, which means like when you, when you come up with um, like the syntax or semantic of computer programming language is part of symbolic logic because it has symbol that you're coming up with an artificial logic um, to support those symbol. But if anybody knows about symbolic logic, that would be great. Um, this is an example of like a very early um, natural language processing app. It's called um, I can't pronounce it. It's S H R D L U, um, and this is not NLP based, and it does things that are similar to like a, a chatbot would do as of today. So it's saying that pick up a red block, 
uh, big red block. And the computer would say, okay, uh, the person would say, find a block which is taller than the one you are holding and put it into the box. And the computer is parsing the text and saying, by it do you mean the one which is taller than the one I'm holding right now? And I guess a silence would mean yes, so the computer says, okay. Um, behind the scene, it's probably using some of the decision tree or like, try a lot of different algorithms or model, but, but it's not necessarily parsing a data set to come up with that response. Um, as I said earlier, this is another example of machine learning where in the slide you see the, um, the word hello in many different language. So in, let's say a training data set has, um, like you trained a system with um, well, how to you train a system to say hello in many different languages, and then all of a sudden, if you if your input um, is goodbye, then the system wouldn't know. Like I I wasn't trained on this. Terminology that I will go over here in future slides and things that are like these terms are good to know. Feature and column are you can think of feature as your columns. So they're, they're interchangeable. Um, and what that means in a data set, if you have a row, row would be one record. And in it, if you have different columns, those would be different attributes of that record. And those are also called uh, feature. Filtering is one, uh, one of the, I would say, aspect that we use in deep learning or neural network. Um, in fact, in a lot of other models or algorithms as well, where you are filtering the data set and getting rid of a lot of different features uh, and focusing on the things that matter. Um, it simplifies the data set, allows you to uh, come up with a solution better. Model, I have, I think I have it in the slide somewhere, actually. So think of um, like a y equal mx plus b, that's an equation. You have an algorithm that uses that equation. But a model would be y equal negative one plus five x, where like it's specific to the data set you're working on. Like you came up with a number to like on for that equation, where like you you would call y equal negative one plus five x a model for that data set. Um, dimension is similar to feature. Dimension meaning a, uh, like a record would have different um, attributes. And when you were uh, like putting it in a graph format, you would um, use different dimension to um, specify different attributes. Training set is um, what you train the data on. And task set is also part of training, but you are testing the data set, or you are testing the model. Um, so if, if you are using a data set to test the model, that would be a test set. And if you're using a data set to train the model, that would be a training set. And the tribute and class are similar. I, yeah, I don't know much about class, but I have it here. So they're, they're similar. Data mining, um, um, I'll talk more about those later, but data mining is subtly different than machine learning, and they also overlap. Um, deep learning is a part of machine learning. I will talk about that for you too. Data science, um, a different field of study, but similar to machine learning or overlaps. Big data is, I'm not actually defining any of those because um, there are sites that are more expensive more. Um, big data is your, you have a data set that you can actually um, come up with a hypothesis or like it, it has, it's, it's a giant set of data where you can use machine learning or other algorithms to um, inspect and come up with unknown parameters. Um, convolutional, ne convolutional neural network is, we use that for image processing, but I'll talk about that shortly too. Any questions so far? Sorry. Okay, I've got a question. I, I, it would, if you've got a machine learning system, I, I, I'm just 
I don't know anything about it myself, so I'm trying to invent it from scratch, okay? I can imagine you've, you've modeled the system somehow. It's got a bunch of constants in it, and those constants, uh, you, you, you pick a different set each time you run the system to see what the outcome is, and you try to find which set of constants gets you the, the, the output which uh, closest uh, to your ideal solution. Uh, but you would still be constrained by the overall modeling formula which you've uh, generated. Is, is that what you're getting at with machine learning or, or is it something else? That's actually, you explained it really well. Um, and when you say constant, I'm thinking of the slope and intercept, right? Yeah. So there is a concept called gradient descent that I will explain uh, in the algorithms section, where it's a very like it's a very well known and fundamental topic in machine learning where when you train the system, you don't the system doesn't know what the correct answer right away. So it goes through all this different equation and figures out which one gives the lowest error. And the one that gives the lowest error is the model that it uses. And when it chooses the models, it also, um, there are, you can combine different models to make a robust algorithm or come up with a robust model. But I think it would be clearer if I explain it there in the slides. Any other questions? Okay. Um, different fields of machine learning. Uh, I think I'm, I said I'm going to focus on this board, computer vision, you know, filtering, data mining, and anomaly detection. So computer vision. Um, this is basically a system of computer vision using machine learning system or anything else. Kind of um, giving a percentage of what the probability of what this object that is seen <coughs> is. So person, if you recognize the person has 99%, it has 99% confidence that it's a person. And they're kind and others. So this, the field of study that helps you decide this is computer vision. So when we look at a flower, uh, we, we see flower because of the, like the thousands of years of, or I don't know the timeline, but millions of years of evolutionary um, I guess the steps that we've been through, it, it, like the eyes evolved and help us like see that it's a flower right away. But if you give it to a computer, it says this, it says pixels. So now it has no way to know it's a flower or not. So the, the artificial intelligence behind uh, this computer vision is the fact that a computer would know based on this pixel that it is a flower. And the way it does it is computer vision, I guess. So here, like it's it's emphasizing certain pixels and then drawing a line and then deciding, hey, it's a flower. And here you have a um, picture of muffin and and on the right side you have what um, pig dog and mop. So a computer vision, even for a human eye, it's very hard to decipher which one is which. But a computer vision system would know, and based on how well you train the system, it would be able to differentiate between the two. And that wasn't too much in depth of computer vision, but <laughs> so uh, moving on to email filtering, when we use, let's say, Outlook, and we say that, hey, um, I don't want this email on my inbox, and then I want, like you can filter by saying that, hey, if, if the incoming emails come from this email address, put it in, in, a, in a certain folder. That's not quite our machine learning there, because it's like, it's actually using a state forward, it tells a statement, a logic to filter that. But using machine learning and email filtering, filtering concept uh, would be, like if you're organizing the incoming email without any human supervision, or yeah, and you're removing the spam or the computer spam emails or the computer virus, um, and 
you're inspecting the outgoing email, a lot of companies may do it so that the employees don't really um, expose confidential information um, to outside world and filter the filter to prioritize some of the messages that are coming and sort the folders based on subject matter, not just the email address. So you would use machine learning on these um, aspects of email filtering. And data mining. So the difference between data mining and machine learning is that data mining focuses on the existing data set and then it finds a missing parameter of the data set. So like let's say you're going to Amazon and then buying books and of certain author. And at the end of the um, transaction, you, you will see a recommendation at the end. Like, hey, you bought this book from a certain author. You maybe like, you would probably like these other authors book. So it's going through the data set and then kind of looking at the pattern and saying that, hey, there is a, like a missing, it's not missing, but like it's, it's a trait that it recognized of that customer and it would recommend a suggestion. So we use that for product, uh, product recommendation. Um, Netflix, Spotify, Facebook uses that a lot. Um, service provider comparison um, or Comcast, they would have um, like specified incentive program um, for specified or geared to a certain customer. So like let's say a customer um, or it Actually, that's for bus. That's the supermarket one. But the service provider, where they would know that um, if, if a customer is not so much so happy about their service, um, and it would detect it based on the communication that's been going under the, I guess, through the through the cable, um, and it would the, the service provider would incentivize and say, hey, if you stay with us, then you would get this benefit. And they use data mining on that as well. Supermarket where loyalty offers are geared toward customers, let's say certain customers come like once a year, but they buy a huge chunk of goods, um, whereas a customer comes frequently but buys really less amount. So their loyalty offer would be different um, for the different type of customers. And in medicine, the DNA sequence uh, mining is also a field where data mining is used, where you are sort of like you are looking through the DNA sequence and then recognizing if if it's something, uh, if it's an anomaly, like if, if this is a if this DNA um, is a symbol for a disease or or like something like a cancer. Um, anomaly detection. It's actually not a separate field. It's under data mining. So when you are mining the data and figuring out the the gold in that data. Yes. So you, you would also detect the anomaly in that. So like let's say uh, like anomalies can be good or bad. So a good anomaly would be Black Friday where a lot of different transactions are happening at the same time. And it's not necessarily like an attack. But a system needs to know that it's an anomaly. It happens once a year and it needs to be adapt it needs to be able to adapt to that. A bad anomaly would be intrusion detection, a DDoS attack. So on the right side, I have this um, picture where an attacker is accessing, like it's going through the controller and spinning up a bunch of zombies and attacking the victim from all those endpoints. So that's overloading the system, hence shutting the victim down. Um, that's a DDoS attack, and in it, it's also an anomaly, and a system needs to differentiate between the good and bad anomaly. And here. It, it needs to take um, actions accordingly. Uh, bank fraud, not necessarily like a lot of transactions at the same time. I mean, it can be, but um, it's not quite DDoS attack, but it's still anomaly. So that's when you were mining the data or you were looking through the existing data set, you would be able to see that pattern and then recognize the anomaly. Um, any questions? So yes. um, So going back to the, um, the So let's say that your the machine is presented with a picture of a black dog, and there's also a shadow of this black dog. How is it able to differentiate between the two? Since you know it's the same color, roughly the same shape outline, 
is it, you know, basically like the contours of the dog. You can see, you know, the, the fur and, you know, recognize that texture, or is it? It depends on how you train your ear. Um, so the answer is it depends. But um, there is a concept called underfit and overfit. So when you overfit, you are, you train your model so much so that it's, it's like looking for that specific pattern and anything beyond that it wouldn't be able to recognize. So like let's say a cat, like if it's if it's a if it, if a model is overfitted, that means that it it sees two different cat, but their cat and it should be able to say that they're similar and they're on the same class, but it wouldn't be able to because of the fact that they're different sizes. So that's called or or maybe it's exact same, but one has like a red dot somewhere in, in the skin. So because of that tiny little difference, it wouldn't be able to say that, hey, they're similar. So that's called overfitting. And underfitting is, um, it's just, it looks at dog and cat and say that, hey, those both of them look similar. So it's overfitting it. I'm sorry, underfitting it. So the in your case, if the trained model is if it's underfit, then it would be, I wouldn't say that if it's underfit, it would be able to say that they're the same. But those concepts come into play when you are training a data set. And based on how much data you give it, and how well you train it, how much iteration you go through, um, that improves the performance. So it's just that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, learning approach. This is my favorite part. <laughs> so there's so many different types of learning. Um, supervised, unsupervised, and semi-supervised are the three main ones. And aside from all the words, if you look at the picture, you see that there are so many different images even feeding the system. So what you're training the data set here is like for it to be able to recognize it's a dog. And the way you do it is you tell it, hey, it's a dog. Like every single data or input that you train the data set on, you label that. That's the first thing. That's the main. Like if you don't take anything about supervised learning, just so know you know that like it's labeled. That's that's one of the important things. So um, label data, and then it knows the answer before even it goes to the goes to training the model. So like here, it knows the output should be a dog. Um, and you feed the system this picture and then it goes through the training of um, different, um, there are so many different steps, but at the end of the whole uh, process, it would say that if I see this pattern when I'm testing or when I'm given a future like input or input feature down the line, I would know that this, this pattern um, symbolizes its dog. So, data labeled with correct answer, and it contains the desired input and output. And you have external supervision, uh, meaning uh, a human, most likely here, would supervise and tell it what to do every single step of the way. And as I said, you tell the output um, at the beginning. And then the aim is to forecast an outcome. So given an unknown data set, it would be able to like given a picture of anything, it would be able to say, hey, it's a dog, or it would be able to say it's not a dog. Um, it's mapping the labeled input to the known mm -hmm. output, and you have direct feedback. So when you go to the testing set and it gets something wrong, you tell it right away that, hey, you got it wrong. So you, you iterate the whole process again and then make sure that it, if it sees that same um, input again, it would be able to get the correct answer. Some of the examples, um, here on the left, you have medicine, and it would be able to recognize um, if it's a drug. Oh, uh, not a medicine, sorry. Given the molecular bond of a chemical, chemical bond? Sorry, I'm bad at chemistry. Um, so given a molecule, it would be able to know if it's a drug or not. 
and on the right side, you were feeding a bunch of images of dogs, and then, give, as I said, uh, it would be able to say if it's a dog or not. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, so I might have answered it already, uh, but uh, go back one slide. Um, so here's the question. How uh, do you uh, have a uh, machine in computer vision to have it distinguish between the objects that you wanted to see and the background? Because uh, you know, if we're using this training, supervised learning, we're training on all these images, um, it's going to be, it's going to take a long, a longer time because, like, if you look at dog 69, you see also a person in that footage, and if you look, or at dog 52, there's another person, so, uh, you know, we're, it's going to be hard, we're trying to train uh, it to recognize a dog, but in, in most of these images, it's being kind of polluted with other things that we don't want it to set you to say or don't. And so that kind of uh, makes me wonder, are, is, it, is there uh, sort of techniques to have uh, a computer sort of filter that out and say, oh, this is where the object ends and begins? And if that's the case, can you also have, and yeah, I think you showed in that other picture that the answer is yes, uh, where you have images where there's multiple objects being recognized. That's a good question. So it would get it wrong in the beginning, most likely, but um, in, and then as I said, you train it to say yes, and then it would say that um, it would emphasize on certain pixels. So the way it does it, there's a, um, that's where the convolutional neural network comes, where if you give it, um, like, given, like it, it would come up with pixels from this uh, image, and then there is a concept of um, feature where you emphasize what are the like pixels that you want it to be emphasizing on, and based on that, it would be able to like it. It would be there is like a calculation that it does, like it multiplies and then divides and all that. Yeah. Um, and if it like if like let's say the human part, uh, and if it if it multiplies and add, like that does the calculation and get a negative value, that would be like let's say this is not like if it's a negative value, then that's not a part of the dog image. So I think it's part of the algorithm. I see. It's it's uh, right. It's training on look in the image, find the object, and you know look if it has a negative value, it's probably not. Yeah. I understand. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on. <laughs> Me neither, <laughs> but that's a very good question. Um, and it, it recognizes... Yeah, just a, a comment. I worked, the first company I worked with back in the late 60s, so this is dated. And I haven't done much pattern recognition since about the first 10 years. But they had a, a demo that they gave when I first started. It was, you could show a machine slides of faces of, different employees, and you train it and go through all this stuff, and it would recognize pretty accurately which employees they were. Now, what was behind the thing is that the features that they used were, they just had pre-selected a random collection of pixels, and they would wait it. And that offended me so much, because it basically knew nothing about these faces. Now, if you take facial recognition now, the way it's done is it figures out where the face is. It figures out things like where the eyes are and how far apart they are and how they are related. I mean, it, it's a feature selection front end of all these algorithms. And I guess I worked on 10 or 15 pattern recognition projects from radar signature recognition and sonar and identifying Morse code manually sent Morse code and identifying the sender for that, identifying paperback book covers for the cover. And it's sort of a two part problem. The first is figure out what features you're going to use. And then there's a whole bag of tricks to figure out well, what kind of classifier you're going to use. And then 
that's just sort of turning the crank. But the thing to keep in mind is the creative part is figuring out the features. And the other thing we had done was we had uh, a couple of really sharp mathematicians that could take a feature set and a training set and go through the features and say, okay, this feature is the best. Or if you're only going to use one, this is the one to use. And then it would go use that and it would say, okay, if you're going to use that for the first one, this is the one to use second. It does the best with what's left over. So the the work in my experience was always spend a lot of time thinking about the feature set and how you're going to get them out of what whatever data you've got that's available. And then my experience was the rest of it is you just sort of turn the crank. My first job was we had a thing called the train that took this uh, radar return data for identifying planes and the once you got features to run the train, it was an all-night thing. And I was a kid and not married, and I was willing to stay there all night. So I, I got to run the train. I was a train engineer. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's labeled, it, it's, that's the supervised part. So you train the model, 
um, well, it, you train the system and it comes up with a model. And then it, then you give it a lot of unlabeled data as a part of test set, where now it's predicting based off of the model that it generated, it's predicting what the label should be of these unlabeled data. And then what we call it is called pseudo-labeling. So you were like, lab the computer labels them, not human. So it's pseudo-labeled. And now those data goes back to the training set. And there is no human intervention. Um, it's just, it's using the pseudo-labeled data as labeled data for the next iteration. So this is where you're using the best of both worlds to come up with something that's feasible. Because a lot of the time, there is, it takes a lot of human labor to um, label each one of the data set individually, I mean, each, of, each one of the data individually. So you, you label a certain set of data and you let the computer generate the other labels, uh, more practical that way. So those are the algorithms. Any questions? Well, not algorithms, different learning approach. We're going to make the slides available afterwards. Um, so moving into algorithms, here, this is kind of going to, like, it's going to be a little bit graph involved. Um, so, Algorithm slash, I would say, approach would be like classification or regression. So the difference between these two is classification. You are you have different like let's say A, B, C, D. These are different way of classifying um, the input. So the output would be any of those five values. So that's classifying it, it's like categorizing it. Regression, on the other hand, it's not a distinct value. It can be any value in, within a range. So it's like real value, like stock price. What's the stock price going to be tomorrow? Or what's the age? Or given all these things that the person is buying from this website, what do you think the weight should be of this person? So it's like a real value. That's, that's when we use regression algorithm. And the models we are using here are linear regression. I'm going to talk about linear logistic and SBM. So first, um, linear regression. So what regression is, is given input value, um, like okay, given different independent um, input values or variables, I would say, um, you're coming up with a target outcome. Like given x1, x2, x3, all the different um, input, they're independent of each other and then you're predicting what the y value should be. That's regression. And if the, the final answer that you come up with is linear in pattern, um, then it's linear regression. So that concept is more suited to the regression algorithm, but we have to modify it a little bit um, to um, the suited for the, the classification algorithm. So here, this is the regular um, linear regression uh, graph, looks like, where you're, you have a lot of different uh, data set in a scatter plot, and then you're drawing a best fit line on, among all those data. And um, here, I'm going to change the y value to x2, because y here is a real value. And as I said earlier, classification is not about real value output. Like it's it's categorizing that. So we'll take off y and we'll put another dimension here. So as I said earlier, these are different independent variables, there's a different feature, hence different dimensions. So given two different input value, I would classify this uh, the data set into two different um, side. And in here, the best fit line itself, it's not going to be, uh, you can't really point at any dot on that line and say that, hey, this is the output. It's going to work as a decision boundary. That's another concept. Um, so it's going to act as a boundary between the two different sides. And whichever side the data falls on, under, that's going to be the classification. The, that's what you're classifying it. I basically said the whole thing. but. Uh, 
This is an example of spam and non-spam email. Um, I stole that from a YouTube video. Um, and here, this the concept that I just mentioned is called decision boundary. So here, you are, you the input value here is the percentage of email body that, that are all caps. Um, and another x2 would be the number of mentions of brand names. So given these two different variables, so you see an email, if the body is all caps, and if the stuff, if it mentions a lot of brand names, then it's most likely that it's a spam. So that's, if it's both, both of them are high, then it goes to the top right corner. That makes it spam. So that's how we're separating spam and non-spam email here. And uh, we draw a boundary, and now we're classifying it. Um, so as I said earlier, uh, that a human can detect it and divides, like, from, like, looking at, from a human perspective, I can see where the boundary is, but the system wouldn't know. So it would try all these different x, y equations that you mentioned, um, well, slope and intercept, and come up with the one that's best fits. So here, it's trying all this equation, right? And what happens is this concept called gradient descent, where you take the slope and intercept, and then you take, you use those as x and, like x and y, and then on the z direction, you come up with the, like you uh, plot the arrows. So if you let a, um, like a ball roll off that entire like slide, it's gonna descend to the most stable place, and that's gonna be the lowest one. Um, but um, there are like local minima, but absolute minima. But aside from all of those, um, if it if it goes to the lowest bottom point, that means that's the equation that got the least error, uh, and that's the model that we use. Um, that's for classification. So. And now for regression. Here, it's the exact same way we use linear regression in math, um, where you're using the y value as it is given number of sales made per day, you are predicting the stock price. I guess it, it sounds pretty simple for a, uh, for a machine learning system, like you were just giving an equation for it to figure out this. But the, the magic is the fact that it got all the data so that it came up with that line by itself. So that's, uh, okay. Here, the equation that you see at the very top, it's, that's the equation it uses to come up with the gradient descent. And that's different than what I showed here, because here, you can get all the data, um, um, like given n data on your data set, you can say that I got, um, like this slope and this intercept got five wrong out of those n. That, that's distinct. But in here, if I go back to this slide where in this equation, it doesn't know like how much of those n value it got wrong. It knows that, um, that it tries those di all these different equations um, as a scatter of like the uh, best fit line here. And then it averages the error that it got. So here, y minus y p would be the y would be the actual value, and the y p is the one that it predicted. That's fine. Why don't people can see where you're printing that? Oh. <laughs> middle part. Yeah. Okay. So here, um, y value is the one that's actual. Y p is the predicted one, and it goes through like for one line like this, it goes through and does this whole average. And then there will be like another line like that, like this, and then it comes up with the equation for all of them. And then it finds the one that had the list value here. And that's the gradient descent for the regression algorithm. So I, I kind of confused some of you guys, but it may not be that important for now. Um, but so that's the regression algorithm sign. Um, then this is the logistic one where it's the exact same concept, but here, instead of having a linear line, you have a logarithmic pattern. Um, and for the spam and non-spam one, the logarithmic, uh, this logistic regression line would act as a boundary. And for the regression one, it would act as uh, the actual line on which you can put the y value. SVM, it's kind of different than the regressions, but what it does is 
like what if you have a data set where you can't really draw a line or draw a long and link line, right? You, what if it's like this, where you have spam and non spam and then spam, non spam email on both sides and spam in the middle, and now you can't really put a line here and then say, hey, I separated both and this is the best fit boundary or decision boundary. Um, or you cannot say this either. What happens, what you do here is you use this concept called kernel trick where you square the, like give, you elevate the dimension to make it simpler for you to divide and come up with a decision boundary. So here, what you're doing is basically squared all the input values and then now it made it simpler and now it can draw a line. Um, for some reason it really works really well and a lot of people got interested in it because of this. Um, and so let's say in here, if all three lines are separating um, the data set, but which one would be the best one? It's gonna be the one in the middle, uh, line C, because it's it's equally distant from both sides, which makes it more flexible. What if you have more data set coming later down the line? Then this the middle one is the one that would best suit um, compared to the other two. And that's where the concept of margin comes, where margin is the difference between, let's say, um, this is the closest, and that's the, okay, so this is the C line, and the difference between these two would be a margin. <coughs> Same as the closest data point would be this and that <coughs> on the right side, and the difference between that and line C would be the margin. And you want to maximize the margin so that your model is more flexible. Um, here, so in this scenario, you would use an SVM model and it would elevate the dimensions and then eventually, like here, it's also like squaring it. Um, and now you can separate the, the two different data set or two different uh, um, I don't know much about the differences in different SVMs, but you use it in the scenarios uh, where, like, if you see on the on this one, it's like all the one data that are in the very like in the middle, and you can't really separate them, and it's having um, trouble differentiating or like separating um, a data set here, but. Because of the kernel trick, um, you can differentiate and come up with this model. Uh, but a linear or logistic regression can be able to do this. And it's actually the similar concept in regression. Um, as long as you are, it's all about the output. So here, like when it comes to differentiating between classification and regression, it's all about the output. Where even if you're, if you're using SVM model, if this boundary itself represents the value, um, like the y value, that would be regression. Or if it's different, if it's different, like separating the classes, then that would be classification. Um, I have like two other algorithms, but so far, is there any question? Support vector machine, and I couldn't understand why it's called that. But I believe it's because you know how the vector space you have like all these different like in a a multi-dimensional vector space would have different vectors and then you draw a line at the very end to connect from point A to point C. So that entire vector in a vector space um, supporting some decision boundary. I guess that's how I like explain it to my head. I guess so that's where the support vector is. Any other question? Fish, cat, dog, right. snake. Yeah. Um, so first off, your x1, x2, and x3 will change. So here, in here, <laughs> um, so 
So you would have like all these different lines, right? X1, X2, X3. Um, and then the support vector machine would be, it's not just clustering one, but there will be like other circles there as well. But somehow, so the, out, the final outcome would show many different circles in one uh, two-dimensional graph. But underneath, it's using all this um, like multiple dimensional layer to separate them. And it's not necessarily going to use a line as a boundary. So I guess it's hard to picture, and I don't have that much expertise on that. But that's how I, when I did my learning, unsupervised learning on this machine learning, um, I this is how I, I included it. If anybody knows anything else, feel free to share. So you can use actually in the regression context, you can use multinomial logic type of models if you have several different categories to classify. Yeah, that's, a, that's the regression analog of, uh, you know, logistic regression analog of multiple categories. So you can use multinomial logic or tropic models. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Okay, so KNN, it's called K nearest neighbor, where you take the vote of your neighbors. Whatever the neighbor says, that's what you said. So in classification algorithm, let's say that um, if K value is 2, then this and you are you are looking for the output for this one, meaning where this dot falls under. It's going to be looking at the nearest neighbor, and it will look for two of them, and whichever gets the highest vote wins. So here, the spam classification wins by a value of two. So that's what makes this one spam. And algorithm like this um, is suited for scenario where, I can't think of one, but scenario where you, you emphasize on your local variables uh, or local data set more than uh, data set, data that are farther from uh, from where you are. So that's where K and um, K nearest neighbor algorithms um, work best. And then the output would be the output of the most K nearest neighbor, out, the output that the most K nearest neighbor have. And K equal 3 would be this, where let's say that you have, um, this one is the, what is it called? Um, it's a non spam row, right? But, so you have K equal 3, so it's looking at two values and then that. And it says two non spam and one spam, so it says itself is a non spam row. Um, but things wouldn't go as expected. Sometimes you would get a, um, a false value. What if, um, what if there's only one neighbor who is spam and one who is not spam? Then it has to kind of average the whole or pick a random one. But it depends on how you're uh, training it. Same concept for regression, but here the point itself. So the point itself holds the y value and then you do the average of the nearest neighbors. That's what I said here. And it's sensitive to the local structure of the data. And sometimes you can assign weight. So the further the neighbor is, the less weight it has. And you can do that by 1 over d, uh, multiplying that by 1 over the distance. And the neighbors are the training set. And another concept, well, another model is called decision tree, where um, you are sort of using a flow chart. So let's say here, I can say that if x1 is 5, anything on the left of it, or anything less than 5, would be non spam So I can come up with a human variable uh, flow chart where I can say that if x1 is bigger than 5, and the, if it's not bigger than 5, then it's non spam And then you can draw another layer of boundary where you can say, now, given that x like given that I'm on the right side, I can say that if x2 is less than 6, um, if it's bigger than 6, then it's not spam, obviously. And if it's lower than 6, then I have to drill down a little bit more. I'm going to separate with the 
x equal x1 equal 8 value, and then I would say if x1 is less than 8, then it's going to be a spam because I'm going to fall under that in the middle section. And if it's not the case, then I'm going to be not spam. Um, so this is a decision tree. It's sometimes if you have a like let's say you have an outlier like a red um, dot right here, it's going to be drilling down and it will focus, like it will zoom in to only that data set, only that, that uh, point, and that can make it very complicated. So it all depends on how much freedom you give to the decision tree and how much level or depth it can go. Um, but that's this decision tree. Um, for, so this, that was the classification algorithm. But for regression, it's similar where you have x1 and y, and then you are, I will just go to the very last one. So here you're saying that if if I fall under the this section, so if x1 um, is bigger than 5, which is this, then I'm going to say that um, my y value uh, here, my y value would be less than 8. So if, if x1 is bigger than 5, meaning here, which is this, um, y would be bigger than 8, so all of these. And if x1 is bigger, I mean, if it's less than 5, which is this section, all my y value will fall under this range. So instead of actually saying, instead of the leaf um, specifying the exact value, you are giving it a range that they're addressing. Um, and what do you do in scenarios like that? You get the average y value of all these to come up with the y value for the next one. And then here, you would average these to come up with the y value for the next one. And random forest, so just Outside the context of machine learning, a forest would be, I mean, it would have a lot of trees, right? So a forest would have a lot of decision trees in machine learning. Um, which means you are not just utilizing one decision tree, you are utilizing a lot of different decision trees and allowing them to give a vote on what the outcome should be, and then you get the highest one, highest outcome. Um, and that's the forest. The randomness is how you limit where it can, it can uh, divide and come up with the boundary. So what I mean is, so like let's say you have um, all this data, data points, and you randomly split them, split, split the data, and then let, um, you come up with three different models for all these different random samples. And let's say the decision boundary is um, three different models, as you see here. And now given a data, future um, input, and then you let the three models decide um, what the answer should be. So if it's a spam scenario, let's say that anything above the line are spam. So that would be yes, this would be no, and that would be no as well. So now the highest vote wins, which is it's not a spam. So the randomness in, so here you can see that I limited the uh, the model so that it doesn't divide on the this line. So that's called you're limiting the feature, like limiting the feature where you can draw the boundary. So that's also where the randomness comes. If it's like a multi-dimensional where you have like seven or ten different feature, then the randomness can be really handy. That's uh, all the algorithms about supervised learning. And I guess I should have had a question right here, but if you have any questions, you can ask. I've been told, one of the data scientists, I've been told that Ensemble 2 is really well, for the most part, as the most model is that true? What's the model? Uh, yeah, Ensembles. Ensembles, yeah. There are a lot of different Ensemble models. Decision tree is just one of them. But sometimes you can have um, one model that's very weak. And it's like similar to saying that, hey, I have an exam tomorrow. Well, not I, 
like there's an exam tomorrow and some students are really weak and some students are really strong or very skilled and they know what they're they know they're gonna ace the exam. So you mix all of them and now the stronger students or more skilled students train like teach the weaker ones. So it kind of helps the weaker ones become more strong or some same one. But um, so that's where Ensemble is um, one of the al algorithms that uses that concept where it combines the weak and strong models and let them help each other, I guess, and come up with a stronger model at the end. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a valid statement. It's a strong... Because if I was implementing evidence to pick one, that's the more important thing. That's the mission. Right, but but when you were starting, you wouldn't know which algorithm works the best. I don't know which algorithm works the best. That's what happens. Right. But in Ensemble, you have Ensemble, you have all these different ones, so it adds to the variable. And there's a if you were adding all these different decision trees, then um, there's a higher likelihood that some of them, some of the decision tree model would get it right. So that kind of helps predict. I have 20 more minutes, so let's see if I can get through the slides. Um, active learning. So active learning is kind of different than supervised and unsupervised, where, but it's also similar to the semi-supervised. So what I, what I mean is, let's see, so you have a database, and you take the 10% of the data, and then you train, you come up with a trained model, and. Um, you annotate the data, so you, you, you kind of label them. And then now it's trained on the 10% of the data. And then you let the let the system predict the 90% of the data. Um, and then it would have a confidence level. So it would say that, hey, I'm 90% confident that this is a human picture or image. And if it's not so much confident, then the human would come and then label it. And the human is happy because he doesn't have to work a lot. He would just pick the one that the computer is confused about and then label that. And, and if it's labeled by a human, and now it goes to the goes back to the training model, and it also goes back to the database. Um, that's called active learning. But there is in it it has a concept called cooperative learning, where you are saying that well, let's, let's say that the system is super confident that it knows what this label, how to label this. So then you, the human doesn't have to interfere. It, like the, he or she would just accept whatever the computer labeled it as. So you're accepting the machine, the machine will label, and then you're feeding that to the database and the train model. So that's active learning. And you can decide which one to label. So let's say that you have um, a video and in a video footage, the the images that are similar, like close to each other, don't need to be annotated because they're similar. So you would choose to annotate one, and then later down the line select some other um, image of the video footage because that's drastically different than the one that's earlier. So you can kind of filter or decide which one to annotate. That's active learning. Um, I'm going to move on to neural networks. So, um, neural network? Go a little bit more. Okay. Um, okay, that's the learning part, right? And this is, um, it's a very important concept, and I'm still figuring out how to understand this. But, so, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of what neural network is. So, neuron, I also stole some of the concepts from one of the uh, really great professor. Um, and I have a link at the very end. This is supposed to be a This is the link right here. So if you click on that, it's going to direct you. So it overlaps with the page number. So you have neuron. This is, the, this is how the human brain, uh, the neuron in human brain looks like. And neural network is somehow um, like it's inspired by the human brain anatomy, but it's not exactly similar. But a lot of it is. So here it's a neuron, and then you have this is called soma, and these are different. Like you can say these are all the hands of that neuron, so these are dendrites. 
and this is a tall leg, and that's an axon. So this part will is axon and will be the and that's. Um, in computer science, we would say that, like, just put it upside down, this would be axon, this would be soma, and all of these are all the dendrites. And so you can have, like, in, even in brain, in human brain, this neuron is connected with all the other neurons, right? There will be like axon of another neuron right here, axon of another neuron right here. So it's like connected. In here, that's a similar concept. So the dendrite um, is connected to an axon. And this is the connecting point. And depending on how strong this is, a signal from here as an input propagate through this neuron and go to the next level. Um, it's just such a bad drawing, but here you have like all these different neurons, right? And all these axons, and these are different connected dots. So a bunch of different inputs for this neuron, right? And then this can be hopefully an output. And somewhere here there will be some calculation of like multiplication, addition, subtraction. But so. We can kind of simplify that model and say that, so this is the same picture, right? And um, here you have input from different neurons. Um, so kind of like evol evolving this to look a lot like the neural network model you would see when you Google neural network. Um, here, it, if you trim all the hands and legs, it looks like this, where Basically, these are three different dots, right? And then this is the output. Um, you can have the same input going through a lot. Like these are actually two different neurons um, accepting the same signal, right? And it would look if I kind of go down the line of what I showed on the earlier slide, it would look like this. And eventually, it would also look like this. So how that works is um, two different output, right? And then this three dot um, These are the dots for all both of the neuron. And this is second, third, and fourth. And this is like. Second, third, and fourth dendrite um, are the ones second, third, and fourth. And this is third, fourth, and fifth would be third, fourth, and fifth. Does that make sense? A little bit. Um, and th there's an example of neural network. So let's say that this is a scenario that I couldn't find any examples that fits, but in my um, work when we get off from work, I guess. Either I personally like to go to gym, but then when we have team dinner, I'm not gonna go to gym, right? So, uh, so I'm choosing between gym and team dinner. Team dinner here, right? Um, so my different um, input should be going to gym or not going to gym. Um, going to team dinner or not going to team dinner. So given these inputs, the output should be, um, this, are, this would have similar output, actually exactly the same. So one combination of these scenarios um, would be either miss gym and go to team dinner, or either go to gym or and miss dinner. And it's the exact same on both of those outputs. So, like, because there are um, two different variables, right? Um, it's like x, x not, y, y not. You can, like, if you come up with the output, there will be like four different combinations, right? But these are the two that make sense because you have to choose either one. Um, the other two kind of 
kind of cancels both of them or adds both of them, but that's not an acceptable scenario here. Um, so what happens is you, when you're training the data model, um, given, so you, it's, a, it's going through a training session right now, and you observe the data. So I went to, I didn't go to gym, but let's say today I didn't go to gym and I went to dinner. And that means that um, I did not go to gym and I did go to team dinner. So these signals would light up or get higher weight because these are the output, I mean input that matters. This do not matter. And here, so we give a random weight, right? So this, each line has a weight. So this has zero, zero. This two has one. Just like um, these two also have one, but um, the one on the right doesn't have weight because that's not the input that we're dealing with. Um, uh, so given these scenario, we have, um, we want to come up with this output where we didn't go to gym and then we didn't. Uh, so how we will start is assigning random weight uh, to each of the uh, each of the sign or connected edge. No, sorry, I forgot the term for that. But um, so let's say we start with like it's totally random. Like we'll give the input value of this a value of 0.3, 0.5, and um, Etc. And here, um, we would say that given we didn't go to gym and then went to dinner, um, if we take for this one, it would be 0.6 and 0.4, because these are the two different input. So if you add both of them and divide by two, you get a value. Um, there are probably other algorithms that you can come up with, but average is the simplest way. Um, of finding the value. So here, um, you are, you got the weight of 0.5, and for this output, the two dots that um, um, adds to this, or that matters, are this line and that line, which has a weight of 0.4 and 0.2. And you add them and average them, give you get a 0.3. So the average, I'm sorry, the the output here, you take the highest one. So there will be like a lot of like millions of other output um, node, but the one with highest value is the one that matters. So here, because it's a 0.5, you say that um, I want to increase this because the optimal value would be one. In that scenario, you would have a weight of one here and a weight of one here. So when you average them, you get one. And that's the definite answer, but we are not there. Um, so the goal is to increase this weight. So the way you do that is you just play around with it. Okay. So here, so you increase this 0.7, and you increase this value to 0.5, just a random value. And now add this to, and that gives you a higher average. Um, there's a term for that, like um, it's called back propagation where you are looking at the output, you are going backward to fix your weight. So these are all the weights. So you fix your weight, um, and after doing multiple iterations on these, eventually you will get an answer. That's like the very basic of neural network, and there are probably something I'm getting wrong, but uh, correct me if I am. Um, but so that's the weight, concept of weight here. There's a concept of bias where you can, because these values do not matter, you can lower them. When you are high, like increasing the weight for these, you can decrease the weight of these because you have more bias towards the values that do not matter. And combining these two, the concept of back propagation, and uh, that's one of the crucial concepts of neural network. So, what's deep neural network is how deep the layers are. So. If you kind of tilt, not tilt, like if you rotate the scenario that I showed earlier, like here, 
this becomes the input on this right left side, and then this becomes the output. You get a um, scenario like that. And this is a hidden layer, right? So there is no layer in between the input and output. That would be a very simple neural network. But if you have one layer, that's still simple. Like it's not deep yet. But if you have multiple layer, that's when if the layer, the total number of layers are more than three, that's what makes it deep. Um, uh, application would be like let's say you have A B C D, um, those are the input value, and then a deep neural network would be able to um, come up with the next set of frames and tag S T. And the higher the layers are, the more precise it would be um, in recognizing the words. And in the fourth layer, as you can see, that it's actually coming up with the phrases. Um, in here, another application um, where the very first one, it's given all the input data, it's, um, it's recognized. On the very, if you have only one layer, it would be able to recognize the edges. If you have, let's say, secondary, it would be able to recognize the different audience, I guess, like eyes, nose, lips, and at the end, it would be actually, like, the higher the layers are, it would be able to have the nice faces. A uh, convolutional neural network is one part of the deep neural network, where you still have multiple, like, layer, but it, it has a specific usage, where it's more useful for images or any input that you can assign pixels to and have spatial relationship. So here, all these different layers have different names and I'm not going to go over these, um, but there are definitely um, videos that you can watch and I have links to those here as well. So the input layer goes to convolutional and then pulling layer and then it dents the whole layer. I, I'm probably going to do a bad job explaining it, but um, at the end it comes up with a yes or no answer. Um, and this is where the filtering happens. Like it goes to the different pixels and then like, multiplies different values and come up with the positive and negative one. And it gets rid of the negative values, so that's like normalizing it, etc. Um, so in this example, it's a scenario where you cannot use the relational network because it's a customer data set where each column, um, so let's say this is name, that's um, C, Z code, and et cetera. Um, if you can swap the columns and still have the same meaning to the data, then you are not going to be able to benefit from CNN. Um, so it's sounds is one example, sound is one example where you can use because of the vibration um, that has a spatial relationship. And it's also great at finding patterns and classifying images. That's the neural network. Uh, I'm going to just fly through and then if you have a question at the end, please ask. Um, so, federated learning, different kind of learning, it's not a neural network, it's a different topic. This is used by Google. Um, I think it's one of the concepts that they came up with. Um, very like this picture has a lot of different words, but simply put, you have, um, like the use case here is a keyboard, a Google keyboard, where when you type something, it recognizes like what's the next word. Um, and it, on each of, like each one of our phone, we have um, like a specialized model that's suited for our phone. But the data goes to the server and then even if it, the data goes to the server, it's not controlled by the, by the server. Um, so it's federated. Where the whole concept is to not have a centralized server give you the decision and what the next word should be, but allowing all the different um, um, iPhone or I guess Galaxy or all the mobile phones to like, each one of them to have the ability to be set what the next word should be. Um, so it gets the data, and then there are all these different uh, phones that's sending the, actually, sorry, let me start here. So you have the initial model that's coming from the server. And then that server is actually simple for TensorFlow. I'm not going to cover that here. But 
this algorithm is using the model and the data that you use on your phone, I mean, that you are entering on your phone, um, that's training a local uh, model. And then all this local trained model from all the different data sets are coming and it's getting fed to the server. And later, it's, it's going to continuous iteration to kind of like um, refine the model and then send it back. But there is some uh, autonomy to the uh, mobile device itself. So that's kind of rate of learning. Um, this is, I think this is the last section, actually second last. Um, relation to other fields, in uh, data mining and machine learning, sorry, this should be out. Um, it's, so machine learning is, uh, when you're doing data mining, you can use machine learning algorithms. But when you're doing data mining, you don't necessarily have to use machine learning algorithms. Um, and there are obviously a lot of different parts of machine learning that doesn't involve data mining. Um, I don't have examples here, but I'm happy to bring some, to bring some research. But. And optimization is one of the concepts that heavily used in machine learning because of the fact that we want to optimize our algorithms. Um, so here I have the equation of like x um, find you want to find the input that gives you, so if this is a algorithm that you're using to minimize um, your value, like the outcome, fx, then you're looking for the input that, among all the data points, uh, minimizes the outcome. And similar here, given if you're trying to find the input that will maximize the output. So that concept, in general, gets used a lot in machine learning, hence a lot of different algorithms and models that we use in optimization field of study um, overlaps and gets, maybe ML field borrows a lot of those concepts in their own um, field of study. So this is a uh, video um, where you are using, these are all these different, I'm not going to talk about these, but these are all these different optimization algorithms. Um, that's it's helping you reset the best outcome. So you can think of this as a gradient descent where we're using all these different optimization algorithms to optimize how to get the minimum error. Um, minimum error. Um, examples would be, for, ins for instance, you have a, if you have a pancreas where you are taking, you're minimizing the blood sugar um, deviation, meaning that you have artificial pancreas and given this insulin, um, you were detecting what's the, like how do you minimize the sugar level given this amount of insulin? Oh sorry, sugar level deviation. I don't know much about um, biology, but this is one of the sector where optimization algorithm is used. Um, bridge construction, where you, you design a bridge where you wanna minimize, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna Minimize the cost, but still want to maximize the load that this bridge can bear. Um, warehouse placement, where we're trying to find, um, minimize the shipment time by having different warehouses and so that the transportation doesn't have to, or the people doesn't have to travel. Um, and statistics is one of the fields where it's very, they have a lot of debate. Like some people try to, I'm not gonna go in depth into the debate itself, but, um, or what's the debate about, but um, we borrow a lot from statistics in machine learning, but statistics itself is still uh, independent, but it's independent uh, field as it is. But what machine learning focuses on, the gist of all these words is, um, Machine learning, because it's a computer science field, it's um, you have a lot of libraries, Python, all these different languages. It's very easy for any user to get head, a head start on using any ML algorithms. Um, but 
and it's like black box. A lot of things are hidden, complicated um, algorithms are hidden from you. Um, and it's, a lot of those are automated as well. And it appeals to the data scientists because there are a lot of data, and then you're focusing on the data to come up with a model. But in statistics, it's a lot about the model, not about the data. It's a lot about how precise the model is, or how general it is, how um, easy it is for people to comprehend. And you are not really focusing on the data itself. Um, and you can have a machine learning model that's very hard to understand. Like you have no idea what this all this different feature is doing. But as long as you get the correct answer, you are happy. But instead, that's not the case. Because you need to know why it did what it did, not necessarily how correct it is on what it did. Um, all right, lastly, I was going to talk about <laughs> machine learning and how we're using it in my company. Um, and this is a giant picture that I borrowed from our company website. But what it's basically doing is I'm not, I actually kind of went through each one of these and it helped me understand what these are. I have links to the links where I actually got the information from. But um, takeaway here is that you have the underneath layer that works as um, storage and monitoring. Um, and this one, well, that's storage. But it's Prometheus and Grafana. Um, those are products that help you sort of utilize and come up with the time series data plot where you can see how your servers are running and which one is damaged or dead. Um, so it gives you a visualization um, of the, the instance that are running on the system. And the storage helps you store. This one is actually, um, this one is Elasticsearch helps you query uh, from the business. Um, like if you have a huge business domain and there are lots of data and you have to kind of like optimize the search query, Elasticsearch helps you on that. Um, Ceph is also similar, but has um, it kind of um, separates the like task or load. It kind of does load balancing on different servers and gives you an optimized result uh, without any delay. I don't know what this stuff about. But uh, Kafka, Strimzy, um, it's a messaging app that allows you to, so if you have different microservices that are talking to each other, and if you have, uh, if you're using Kafka, um, that would help you send a message from one service to another. Logstash helps you logging, Jenkins helps you deploy, um, um, have a continuous delivery and continuous uh, integration. So these are for, as it says here, um, queuing and streaming. And these are for TensorFlow is one of the library that machine learning, um, it's a very robust machine learning library that helps you analyze. And Kibana is, helps you report. And on all of this, on top of all of these, like sits the AI library and the REST API. And um, this whole structure is, it's actually taken from Massachusetts Open Cloud that's uh, initiated by five or six different universities in Boston um, who are implementing this on OpenShift. And that's where Red Hat, um, because OpenShift is a Red Hat product, it's a platform as a service where you can, the, we provide the platform where you can deploy your application um, without having to worry about um, the infrastructure underneath it. And this is one of the products that Red Hat helps um, supporting. And this one uses some machine learning. And Open Data Hub is like one of the initiatives that Red Hat actually came up with very recently. It's in version 1.x as of now, um, where the goal, the goal is to have OpenShift as a platform and on top of that, um, have create an artificial plat um, intelligence platform where um, you can run your AI applications. Um, and as of now, our focus is on the first two layer because we already have the storage and um, 
data in motion part where the, the Seth and then Kafka, these are existing products, but on top of that, what we are um, aiming to achieve is to have um, the streaming and the different integrating, integrating different AI libraries. So Open Data Hub falls in one of those, where um, it also helps you, like it, it gives out of the box um, AI libraries for you to help get a uh, jump start on some of your applications. And if you want to learn more, there is a link for data project at Open Data Hub, and uh, there is a talk for machine learning from Red Hat. And these are different scenarios where we are using machine learning. Uh, FSI stands for financial service. Forgot, sorry, but it's it's for financial um, um, sector within Red Hat, and we're using that to actually do analysis on pricing and coming up with the risk. It's a risk analysis tool. Um, anti money laundering is literally going on here. Um, and I also have ways to get involved. I couldn't really. Um, so these three links actually have embedded links in it that help you. There are suggestions for different courses you can take and uh, different open source projects that you can contribute to. And with that, I do not have a question started, but I will open it up for questions and comments. that you can just do everything on a simplified Jupyter notebook in terms of implementation of all of this stuff? Um, For a small scale, like, with a concept project, not like production. You might want to repeat the question. Sorry, I'm here. Is it true that you can use this Jupyter notebook um, as a head start? For like as, as just say it's a pet project in a corporation, right? And somebody yeah. wants to use machine learning. Is it true you could just do the notebook and do everything from there? Honestly speaking, I haven't used that, but I did read through the Jupyter notebook, and it looks like it allows you to, um, like it, it gets it gets you going as a developer. You can just like code on that notebook and then um, deploy the application without having to worry about the servers that are running yeah, the scene. Yeah, stuff. right. So if assuming all those are true, which it is, um, I think it should be the answer to be yes. But I'm not sure. You, you, you can develop your tooling, but running the models, all the training, all the, you know, how to learn, how to recognize the dog, that's heavily intensively on your CPU. It's usually where you have a farm of tons of processes uh, running to do that. But all the other stuff, all the math, all the, 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 the detection of what is the, where to put our weights and all, and that's development. That's usually a developer works to be doing that. But running the actual learning of the models and all that, getting close to HPC in some cases while you're doing that. It's very intensive. It can take a long time to do it. But I'd give it a shot. I mean, in the old days, we were doing it on a 32K byte. I actually have seen it done on um, some uh, Jupiter. Um, I've seen some simple ones done. Yes. If you take a look at FAES. Proof of concepts uh, can be done on work on workstations. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I just see. Yeah. I've seen that. If you take a look at FAES machine learning, you'll get some good examples to start with. I think. We know that our minds are not like computers. Do you ever think that perhaps we, the mathematics that we have at our disposal and the computers that we have are not really well suited or optimally suited for these kinds of problems. Um, good question. And um, I guess that's the journey part of it. So um, I'll turn around. Why do you think your brain is better suited than the computer brain? Why not turn it around? Why is the why is the brain better than the computer to determine some of these problems? Oh, I don't think birds tell us much about airplanes either. So, no, I don't think that, I'm just wondering, I've worked on some complex things in the last 60 years. This is way beyond anything I have worked on. And I wonder if we really have the tools to do an exceptional, wonderful job of this. So, so just actually just is determining yeah. that a pattern is, is a dog is a really tough thing. 
but it's done. I mean, the pictures we saw in some of what do are real pictures and real systems in production today that literally just sits up and can detect, wow, here is this people walking. Is that person actually supposed to be walking there or not? Or did that person do something that is outside the normal? I mean, all the pattern recognition we talk about, should I raise the alert? Is that as a suspect or is that just a normal person passing by? Yeah. All of that is AI today. Right. Other people, not me. But yeah, that's, that's true. Things. And I guess, uh, so I went to this conference called Race Hopper Conference uh, two years or a year ago. Actually, one year ago. And the keynote um, speaker talked about how we are feeding unconscious biases to uh, the machine learning, or not just machine learning, the AI algorithms. Uh, because like, if the researcher is biased about something, and that actually affects the algorithm. So it's, it's crucial to have diversity in the researching field so that people from different mindset can implement and make the robot or the AI that it's building um, unbiased. Mm -hmm. So there are some that games, and that's obviously a question to answer is, do we have the tool to achieve what we want? Yes. So I want to know how, how is that used along with the to determine the weights of the nodes? The weights of the nodes. Uh, in that specific scenario, uh, the concept of gradient descent is just uh, so that you can minimize the error. But you go through that entire iteration, and then on that one iteration, you have certain weights. And when you do the next iteration, um, it's not necessarily doing the setup, doing the 3D plot of like, hey, if I, if I use this slope and this intercept, I'm gonna, and I have this least amount of error, that's, that's the weight I'm gonna take. It's not like that. Um, so it's kind of different the way we use it on the um, neural network side, as far as I understood, because we will just randomly um, decrease the weight or increase the weight based on where we are and then see where it goes. So the grading concept gets used on a higher level, but not like we are not plotting a gradient descent when we come up the weights. So, so no information is fed about the errors to the to the weights when you're when you're trying to rectify or when you're maybe running multiple iterations. We don't feed any information about the errors that you get. Um, there is an equation, I forgot about it, actually. So, I mean, I don't know the equation itself, but there is a, uh, you get the new uh, weight based on the old um, error. And I actually, I'm glad to find it out. But there, there is, I believe there is a way you can feed the old error um, into the equation. To come to a lot of these models are recursive. Like, it will adjust itself based on what it gets back. But there needs to be a feedback loop that tells the model, am I right or not, at some point, or how close I am. If you notice, the, right in the first picture said that there was a 70% chance that it was a person, a 90% chance that it was a, a kite. That's the way the whole thing works. It's, it's all a matter of approximation. And the more iterations you do, the better it gets at that approximation. But it's still an approximation, and it is a feedback loop. And it's how you create that. And eventually, you don't need to have humans in that loop for that to work. It's kind of amazing, because we don't really know how that model works when we're all done. The computer does. It made itself, based on all that experience we gave it. But we gave it hundreds of years of experience in a couple of days. We live days one by one, <laughs> and, and grab, gradually give that experience. And that's how we learn whether should we put our hands when it's hot or not, or should we run or should we not run based on our experience. These models are trying to simulate that. Whether they're true is a different matter. <laughs> but that's what they're trying to simulate, that it's not like programming where you say, here's my input, here's my algorithm, here's my output. And every time I run it, that's the exact result, and I can predict that. We don't know what's in the box. But we know it's a complex problem, because is it a foreground or is it a background image? Uh, 
is the data, you know, I'm looking at transactions over days or years to see the, if there's fraud, blah, 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 blah. There's tons of parameters that we might not know today. But by analyzing the patterns, this can learn how to recognize stuff that we as humans cannot. Because we can't grasp that much data, that much experience. That's the interest, to me, the interesting part here is that we are making the computer able to do algorithms that we may not even be able to define. I mean, for instance, how do we define whether something is a cat or not? That, you know, how do you know when you see someone's face that that, well, how, you, how do you describe that you recognize someone? And turn that into computer language and say, how would you make that code so it could recognize someone's face and relate that to their ID and all that stuff? That's a very hard problem to solve. It always has been. Now, we've cheated. <laughs> I, I love that because we try to get approximate, but it's still an approximation. And as humans, we still make mistakes, right? Your eyes are very easily fooled. Your brain is very easily fooled with certain pictures. That you think something might be bigger or smaller, or maybe the line looks straight to you, but it's actually not. We easily cheat it because our experience is not good enough to recognize those situations. And so uh, that's what I love. So to Peter's point, one of the things we made about machine learning or AI is you don't actually have an algorithm in your gut. Um, you have a model, lots of data goes in, and it's able to spit out the results. My question back to you is, can we extract from what's done what, what are the attributes that actually matter versus what didn't? So most decision processes, you know, there's multiple attributes that go in. Right. Can we determine what, yes. what attributes actually matter? Yes. That's how we filter the dimensions. And then the whole concept of filtering is to lower the uh, dimension and filter out the attributes that matter. So yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Well, you know from you guys, but I think as a beginner, she did very well. <laughs> get posted on the meetup page at the very least so you guys can get access. Now we have Rich Line and we have a lot of kudos. Some of you have come up and help people that have questions and so on. And if you are working for a company who are looking for people to hire, maybe you want to come up here too so people can find you and have a discussion. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's nice to see the whole room full. Big smile. Yep. Thank you. Very good.